Speaking of excitement, we're going to deal with Islam today, especially um, um, its origins and um, how it functioned under the under the Ottoman state. We do this because um, this has everything to do with um, what Islam was, what it what it is in southeastern Europe, its connection with Judaism, um, and the fact that really more than anything else, Islam is a military doctrine. Um, it's a doctrine of state, um, and only in a very, very indirect way is it a religion. Um, Allah is the, is the cosmic general of the Islamic forces rather than a, a god in any, in any normal sense of the term. It does borrow imagery from the Talmud and the Old Testament. Um, but it's been done, you know, it's been demonstrated many times before. Um, and the, the Jewish connection, uh, you could find this in, in the, uh, article where Islam and Judaism joined together, a perspective on reconciliation, which is published by Palgrave in, in 2014. Um, but the Ottoman Empire was, essential to what Islam became in more modern times. Um, it invaded and colonized southeastern Europe. And if it wasn't for the Russians um, and the Austrian Empire, uh, would have penetrated much further. But by the early 15th century, um, most of Serbia was in Islamic hands. And then really... Um, by the 1460s, even the northern princes uh, had had collapsed, and Serbia was largely depopulated, and the Turks wiped out all remnants of resistance, leaving only a few monasteries and villages behind. And the bulk of the Serbs uh, moved north into Hungary. The Turkish forces were, were garrisoned in the cities, uh, and these were forbidden for uh, for Serbs. Land was a matter of the sultan to, to give and was granted only to his most loyal people. So the Balkans eventually was divided up amongst, you know, maybe a thousand major Islamic landholders, including Slavs who converted. Serbs became serfs of the Turkish elite and they were known as Raya, uh, which is the Islamic uh, version of Goyim, which means cattle. So both Raya and Goyim mean the same thing. So once the initial slaughter destroyed all resistance, um, the handful of Serbs that were left in the countryside were left alone, so long as taxes were paid on time. Um, of course, all villages were, were run on a cooperative basis, and these communes were empowered by the Sultan to collect taxes and, and to maintain law and order. And it was in Islam's interest to see that the, the community was uh, preserved this way. And it did have the unintentional effect of preserving certain elements of, of medieval politics. So rural Serbia under the Turks became a federation of, of um, what amounted to independent villages, and yet the cities um, were alien. They were um, the domain of Jews and Turks, and, and these were the only people who were allowed to live there. Um, and much like in Ukraine and so many other places, nationalism uh, developed as a rural uh, peasant-based phenomenon, which you know, gives the lie to, to all the modern theories that this is a primary, primarily a, a uh, industrial uh, modern doctrine. Only very rarely is that the case. Um, and in much of the Slavic areas, uh, Ireland and a few other places, uh, even Germany, uh, nationalism was always a peasant uh, anti-industrial and anti-financial movement. So just, you know, so much of the scholarship on nationalism in, in Mainstream scholarship is, is such a disaster and is so dishonest intellectually. Now, Montenegro um, was preserved as an independent unit because of how inaccessible it was. It was uh, pretty much roadless. And since the Turks were so dependent on, on cavalry, um, they really were not able to subjugate, had no interest really in subjugate a people that they really didn't, didn't have much financially to offer. Um, uh, Dragnich, uh, one of my favorite authors in this, in this topic, on this topic says, uh, and he's talking about Islamization concerning, um, 
uh, Southeastern Europe, he says, the process was a continuous one, but its fervor and intensity were not. Certain periods in certain areas with certain people, the process would explode, usually triggered by some violent event. Something would happen, such as Albanians siding with Venice in a dispute with the port, or the Serbs would join the Austrian army in its incursions into the territory. The aftermath would be intensified Islamization. Pressures would be applied, and on such occasions, Serbs would usually show more intransigence than, than Albanians. Albanians could never understand that inherent Serbian hostility toward the Turks, but then they had no Kosovo in their heritage. The Greeks, on the other hand, understood it very, very well. We'll be talking about the fraud of, of Albania here um, in a little while. There's a, there's some idiot on, on Facebook that really hates me. Um, she's a, a Albanian, but I think is Orthodox. And she's so dumb, she doesn't realize that I'm, I'm actually referring mostly to um, Islamic Albania. And that my position on the matter was the dominant one in, in uh, um, early, early, early and mid 20th century uh, British scholarship in the matter, especially uh, Neville Forbes. Anyway, um, one recurring theme um, in the modern secular West in Islam um, is the use of Islam in parts of Europe and the Middle East to use as a battering ram against their opponents. And this goes back to the early 20th century. Britain supported the continued rule of the Ottoman Empire over the Balkans as a way to block Russian influence. And at the same time, they trained and armed the nomadic mountaineers, the Caucasus against Russia, again, for the same for the same reason. Many of these became Chechens, which, again, is is an is a, a artificial creation of the London banks. In modern times, Western support for the Albanian national movement, which is a uh, Islamic one, like bankrolling and arming uh, something called ISIS, support of the Chechen rebels, support of the Bosnian fundamentalists, that's just a handful of examples, shows that it's the West that supports, finances, and really sponsored the reinvigoration of Islam in the 20th century. Jews under Islamic states were a privileged group. Um, there has never been any war between Muslims and Jews except for um, over, over Israel. But prior to that, there was no such entity. Um, Christians, though, uh, Orthodox people, were persecuted at all levels. But you know the similarities between Talmudic Judaism and modern Islam are far too uh, um, far too uh, identical to be anything but, but you know anything uh, coincidental. Both are largely political and legal doctrines, using some theological symbolism and, and some verbiage like that. Islam really is Judaism for Gentiles. In the West, masonry and the occult plays a similar role. In the East, it's Islam. Islam and its political agenda really is inseparable from Judaism in, in almost all respects. Now, early on, um, early tracts from the Greeks and other Orthodox nations on Islam are, are, are pretty common. These people were the first line of defense for Europe against the, the, the Turkish invasions, and because of that, it, it produced a steady flow of these, of these doctrines. Now, St. John of Damascus, who died in 749, has an authority that very few people can challenge. He was the financial secretary and translator of the caliph in Damascus, um, uh, Walid ibn um, Abd al-Malik, who died in 715. Because he was both knowledgeable in Greek and Arabic, and at the time that was an important qualification that very few people actually possessed. His treatise against Islam was um, the first major uh, Christian response to this new religion. St. John inherited this position from his father and was in fact pr promoted even to a much higher position, specializing in financial matters, bringing in uh, Greek budgetary and mathematical principles into the newly formed Islamic government. Um, his grandfather, was um, Mansur uh, Sargun, was involved in assisting the Muslims in taking over Syria in the middle of the 7th century. From this, John's father was given the position of governor of Damascus under the caliphate. So therefore, St. John was raised in the caliph's household and knew Islam as a political idea, but the da daily behavior of its elites, very few people in the Christian world, in fact, no one in the Christian world knew Islam like St. John did. Um, but there's nothing surprising about this. Uh, it was Islamic policy at the time to keep the, keep the older Greek administration intact 
the Mansur name itself uh, is likely Syrian, really, um, rather than Arabic. And John's resignation from this post in the Caliphate was probably not, not voluntary, um, since it was around the time that the pro-Greek orientation was being challenged. As soon as there were enough Muslim bureaucrats who could master the old Greek and Syrian uh, administrative ideas, the old families were removed. Islamic and Jewish authors have tried to downplay his role as secretary to the caliph, um, but they don't do a very good job of this. Um, James Addison, in his The Christian Approach to the Muslim uh, Historical Study, says, St. John displays a thorough knowledge of Islam and is fully at home in the Arabic lang language, often citing the Quran word for word and showing his familiarity with the Hadith. But it was partially, it was mostly, I should say, his linguistic abilities and his upbringing at court that made him indispensable and they trusted him for this reason. But here's what St. John, the expert here, says about early Islam and what it really is. These used to be idolaters and worshipped the morning star and Aphrodite, whom in their own imagery they called Kabar, which means great. So down to the time of the Emperor Heraclius, they were simply idolaters. From that time to the present, a false prophet named Muhammad appeared in their midst. This man, after having chanced upon the Old and New Testaments, and likewise having conversed with an Arian monk, devised his own heresy. Then having insinuated himself into the good graces of the people by a show of seeming piety, he gave out that certain book had been sent down to him from heaven. He had set down some ridiculous compositions in this book of his, and it gave to, he gave it to them as some object of veneration. So St. John suggests that Islam isn't a separate religion, but a much older heresy, using the Old Testament, uh, Arianism, and Judaism um, to create this, this uh, amalgam. There's nothing new here. Um, there's nothing new even in, in the Quran. But the sect of Muhammad filled the power vacuum between Ber Persia and Byzantium. The three ancient sources, the St. John himself, the Emperor Constantine uh, Prophogenitus, and John the Deacon, all three of first-rate intellectual ability. All three of them argue that Muhammad was not the founder of a new religion called Islam, but that Islam was just another Christian heresy coming from the remnants of both Arianism and Nestorianism um, with some um, Talmudic uh, additions. So St. John des describes the, the origin of Islam like this. Um, they used to be idolaters and worship the morning star and Aphrodite, um, as I mentioned before, um, that he, um, he writes, well, he, he writes in this respect, talking about Islam and talking about its moral code. He says, although you may not marry a wife without witnesses or buy or acquire property, although you neither receive a donkey nor possess a beast of burden unwitnessed, and although you do possess both wives and property, uh, and, and so on through witnesses, it is only your faith and your scriptures that you hold unsubstantiated by witnesses. For he who handed down this to you has no warranty from any source, nor is there anyone known who testified about him before he came. On the contrary, he received this while he was sleeping. And St. John realized that this was one of the most, um, one of the big vulnerabilities of this new, of this new religion. Because Muhammad had consistent and ongoing revelations throughout his life. And that's what guided him in his military and political decisions. And many centuries later, they were written down in, in what we call the Quran today. But the problem, he notes, is that th these were not seen by anybody else, and that he was sleeping at the time, that these were dreams. And so the point he's making is that so much in Islamic legal theory requires witnesses, everything but the Quran itself. The Quran's description of Muhammad's own revelations is odd. Um, divine revelation in the New and Old Testaments, for example, is a simple affair. God speaks to whoever he wants, and he gives instructions or whatever. But this isn't the case with Muhammad. In fact, initially, Muhammad had no idea who he was talking to. Um, that he had no idea that it was the Archangel Gabriel who was doing this, and that the angel's voice, uh, or the angel was very violent towards Muhammad. And, um, in fact, he almost wanted to kill himself. He says, Muhammad says this, he says, I'll go to the top of the mountain and throw myself down that I may kill myself to gain rest. So I went forth to do so, and when I was midway to the mountain, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Muhammad, Thou art an apostle of God, and I am Gabriel. I raised my head towards heaven to see who was speaking, and lo, Gabriel came in the form of a man with feet astride the horizon, saying, O Muhammad, thou art the apostle of God, and I am Gabriel. 
But Muhammad had no peace with these revelations, and he hated the fact that he was chosen here. Um, the satanic verses, ver verses, they bring to mind the infamous case of Salman Rushdie. But the satanic verses in Rushdie's book themselves are a reference to the revelations that Satan proclaimed through Muhammad. It's not just Allah that spoke through him. The context was the inability of Muhammad to convert members of his own tribe. Um, so Satan sees, sees the opportunity to preach compromise when his tribe rejected his new teaching. In other words, his desire to compromise with his own tribesmen uh, who sought to retain their own gods gave Satan the notion to permit this syncretistic form of worship combining Islam and paganism. And that became a part of Islam. The point that his opponents used against him was that if Satan could use the prophet as a mouthpiece on this occasion, on another occasion, how would he know? And how could he tell the difference? How could we tell the difference? Um, now, ultimately, the, the archangel allegedly informed Muhammad of his error, but it caused him uh, tremendous pain later on. Now, some apologists of Islam deny the historicity of this, but it is mentioned and accepted by people like uh, Ibn Ishaq, uh, Ibn Said, uh, and Tabari, and the great Quranic, uh, Quranic interpreter, interpreter um, Zamak Shari, and who died in 1143. So the fact that part of Islam was dictated by Satan is uh, an accepted part of the Islamic religion. Um, he um, he criticizes Islam when they claim that we they don't allow any images in worship, but of course there is the Kaaba stone. And John says that this is an object of idolatry, uh, idolatry, idolatry for Islam, and they kiss and caress it, as he says, when, when in its presence. Um, in a very, a very early medieval form of sarcasm, John mockingly says that just because Abraham had relations with a woman on it or tied a camel to it doesn't make it an object of worship. In other words, he's suggesting that lacking a tradition of its own, they pretty much grab onto anything and make it significant. But less humorously, he says, this stone that they talk about is the head of that Aphrodite whom they used to worship and whom they call Kabar. Even to the present day, traces of the carving are visible on it to careful observers. You know that stone is part of the um, uh, Mecca pilgrimage, since it's at the very center. The Kaaba stone is at the very center of the pilgrimage in Saudi Arabia. And St. John accuses Muhammad of making up the laws he, as he goes. You know, the revelations are very convenient that they almost border on the comic. And he says, St. John says, Muhammad had a friend named Zayd. This man had a beautiful wife with whom Muhammad fell in love. Once they were sitting together, Muhammad said, Oh, by the way, God has commanded me to take you as my wife. And the other answered, Well, you're an apostle. Do as God has told you and take my wife. Rather to tell the story from the beginning, he said to him, God gave me the command for you to put away your wife, and he put her away, and several days later, now he said, God has commanded me to take her from you. Then after he had taken her and committed adultery with her, he made this law. Let him who will put away his wife, and if after having put her away, he should return to her, let another marry her. For it is not lawful to take her unless she have been married by another. Furthermore, if a brother puts away his wife, let his brother marry her, should he wish. And that's from the Quran, Surah um, 2225 and following. Now what does this mean? He wanted this woman, so he told her husband that God just told me a minute ago that uh, you need to put her away. Not quite divorce her, but just kick her out of the household. Once he did that, he said, oh, God spoke to me again a minute ago, maybe just a few seconds ago, and said, um, she needs to be mine. And they go, oh, well, you're an apostle of God, what can we say? And so that wasn't enough. He then made a law universalizing that, saying, that, oh, well, you know, if you um, put your wife away, then someone else has the right to marry her, which clearly is just about him. So that's how bad it is, and that's how bad um, this religion first began. But these are almost comic. They're very, very convenient revelations that they have no parallel in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Prophets never received permission for this behavior. Um, even King David, who came close to that, was condemned for it. King David didn't say, oh yeah, I, I, the king is allowed to do that, so it's okay. No. Um, he wrote Psalm 50 to show his heartbreak here in doing what he did. The law didn't change because King David had a guilty conscience. 
as we see here with Muhammad. Now, God's law is solid, where in Muhammad's case, God's law is whatever he says it is. Um, but the, the early growth of Islam is nothing to romanticize. Um, now, it's true in the Old Testament, you have several examples of divinely ordained slaughters. But in fairness, these were the commands of the Creator to destroy peoples engaged in some of the worst kind of um, collective uh, corruption possible. I mean, God flooded the world in Genesis. His commands to destroy a tribe or a village were the same thing. But Muhammad can't claim any kind of uh, divine sanction for any specific group. This is simply how the movement developed, and like everything else, it very conveniently became a part of um, Islamic law. But even in the Old Testament, it's the sins of Israel that led to constant wars, defeats, and foreign occupation. That it was the Israelites who were slaughtered more than anybody else. Um, so you, know, you can't use that here. But but the early spread of uh, Islam and Christianity, for example, you compare the two, and they couldn't have been more different. Uh, Christianity struggled as the alternative to official paganism and Judaism, which were uh, very similar um, up until that point. And really, it, it spread only through the determination of its martyrs. It didn't have any military force of its own. Um, but even when it was made the official religion under Theodosius of the Roman Empire, emperors still backed the her heretics almost exclusively. Um, uh, almost as much, if not more so, than orthodoxy itself. So orthodoxy was always a, a suffering sect, while Islam was largely a, a um, an army that had this mystification surrounding it that they then call it religion. So military force wasn't something that was an exception, it was the rule. Um, even Muhammad's own, own words show Islam really as a military doctrine, not a not a religion. God isn't really a, a, a personal God. He's a very distant um, entity with, with very little contact with humanity. Um, and that's why he needed Muhammad in the first place. Then after that, the Islamic government then served as a substitute for divine intervention in, in human affairs. So everything that Islam did was through conquest. Um, and the Jews did very well under the Islamic State, and um, which shows you the, the, the corruption and the very similarity between the two uh, so-called religions. Um, Hilary Belloc writes in his um, critique of early Islam, he says, such a revolution had never been. No earlier attack had been so sudden, so violent, or so permanently successful. Within a score of years, from the first assault in 634, the Christian Levant had gone. Syria, the cradle of the faith, and Egypt, with Alexandria, the mighty Christian sea, within a lifetime, half the wealth and nearly half the territory of the Christian Roman Empire was in the hands of Mohammedan masters and officials. The mass of the population was becoming affected more and more by this new thing. Only in the historical, the ahistorical morass of, of modern America, can anyone claim that the Crusaders uh, were in fact the aggressors uh, in these subsequent wars? Um, the Crusades were very poorly organized. There were rear guard actions that ended up doing more harm than good, especially in it to stabilize the, the Byzantine state, which was really the only substantial and knowledgeable force against Islam at the time. But there's something about Islam that permitted it, it spread above fire and sword. Um, it's the main source of Islam's growth, but not the sole source. Belloc says, it was a combination, the attractive simplicity of the doctrine, the sweeping away of clerical and imperial discipline, the huge immediate practical advantage of freedom for the slave and riddance of anxiety for the debtor, the crowning advantage of free justice under a few and simple new laws, easily understood, um, that, that formed the driving force behind the astonishing Mohammedan social victory. The courts were everywhere accessible to all without payment and giving verdicts which all can understand. Um, He's wrong about some of this, um, especially since where the Jews were concerned. Um, but it goes to show that, that Belloc was not just uniformly hostile. Islam came into existence because it filled the vacuum between Byzantine, uh, Roman, and the Persian empires, who had exhausted themselves. So after the Battle of Nineveh in 627, both empires retreated, leaving a no-man's land in the Middle East, such that the, an ideology like Islam can fill, and it used the lucrative caravan trade with skill, and then used this money along with Jewish support. That's what made Islam successful, where other contenders have, have failed. So it wasn't like they could just simply take over the caravan trade to the Far East and back again. 
and charge tolls and make their money that way. You need Jewish financial backing for to be able to do that in the first place. Um, but Christian groups long out of communion with Constantinople, like you know the Nestorians or the Monophysites, were very easy to mobilize with the right rhetoric and promises. What Bellux is above is really promises, not the reality. The courts did not operate that way. Um, slavery was far from abolished. I don't know where Hillary Bellick gets that. It reached its apogee under Islam. Islam drained Africa of slaves. And, uh, because they, um, they, um, they made them into eunuchs. They, um, they castrated their slaves. This is why you don't have a large black population in the least. But once the initial conquests under Abu Bakr were complete, um, after that, it was very easy to offer protection to the merchants and traders going back and forth from the Greeks to the Far East. And using local elites to continue the rule of the old system, um, really why it wasn't a revolutionary con uh, con conquest at all. Like the Romans, they maintain the continuity in the administration. So there, I'm not entirely sure what, what Bellic means there, unless he's really talking about um, the attractive promises that were made. Certainly not the reality. But this is what Islam had stated to the population, this is what's going to happen. But of course the opposite uh, happened. Um, uh, debts were not forgiven. Um, it created a, a two-tier society, and it became really a Judaic uh, oligarchy over um, over the, the Christian population. Um, another scholar in, 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 uh, in this, uh, Fred Donner, writes in uh, 1981, talking about this initial conquest, he says... Um, the methods outlined above did contribute much to the state's cohesion, above all by providing organizational goals that were super-tribal in the context of a justifying ideology. But day-to-day -day stability of the new regime and the effectiveness with which the rulers were able to control the thousands of tribesmen now under their charge and to bring them to do their bidding was the result of the elite's keen awareness of the ingrained strength of tribal ties and of the ways in which these ties could be used to foster rather than obstruct their consolidation of power. So the point is, the Muslim movement early on stressed the importance of the state, stressed the strong administrative unit, so it could both engage in prolonged wolf warfare and then rationally rule a conquered territory. Once the internal dissension among the tribal leaders of the Arabian nomads was stopped by showing the benefits of concerted action, the rest was just a matter of, of administration. But both Byzantium and Persia had this state structure. This is why their empires lasted as long as they did. Now, they weren't modern states, because noble families still did a lot of uh, the administration. But you could see the concept in outline. It was a bureaucracy, a professional, nonpartisan, that could take over and run the state, where, like, say, a weak or corrupt or non-existent monarch uh, would otherwise destroy uh, the gains that more competent monarchs had, had established. But once those two empires receded in the 7th century, imitating their form wasn't that difficult, especially when the income from raiding the caravans uh, then taxing them later on came into the plan. Now, the Ottoman Empire itself, I mean, that's, that's your establishment of, of Islam. Um, your modern history text concerning the, the Ottoman Empire is largely apologetic in tone. Um, and this is because, not so much they love Islam so much, but because they really only have one enemy, and that's Christianity, you know, Orthodoxy. So they universally support the Jewish view of world events. Um, one example of this dishonesty is that they, they claim, almost without exception, that the Orthodox were permitted to retain, to remain such, um, so long as they paid an extra tax. But without fail, they'll then say that this proves that Islam was, was far more progressive than the Orthodoxy was. They use the word tax and they don't explain it, the jizya. That's usually glossed over in history text, as if it was no import, but it's of immense significance. They use the word tax as if it's financial, but it was not. The Balkan countryside was almost entirely non-monetized. Um, so the tax was taken in kind, but this isn't the entire meaning of, of the, the uh, Yizya attack, tax. But the idea, you can find this in the Quran. It says, fight those among the people of the book who do not believe in Allah nor the last day, nor forbid what Allah and his messenger have forbidden nor embrace the religion of truth until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So money is not the only or even the main element of the tax. Jizya is about submission, not money. 
So the word taxes is the wrong term to use, but every single textbook in the subject will use that term. In the Balkans, um, the tax was done in public. So those paying it, the Christians were the only ones who had to pay it. They had to humiliate themselves in some fashion. Sometimes they pulled the beard out. Sometimes they would smack the palms or the, or the bottom of the feet. Sometimes the, the payer was just beaten. So the concept of the tax was that one's life was ransomed in cash or some other form of payment. So it's extortion. The non-Muslim's life is forfeit by definition. Keeping you alive is a favor that Islam does for you. And in recompense, uh, the jizya is, is, um, is, um, allocated on you. This is part of the reason why Islam was so successful in getting converts. Marco Polo, the famous traveler, he says this concerning the Muslims in Iraq. He says, according to their doctrine, whatever is stolen or plundered from others of a different faith is properly taken and the theft is no crime. While those who suffer death or injury by the hands of Christians during an attack are considered as martyrs, as these principles are common to all the Saracens. So, some some of these guys, you know, uh, modern historians will say that the tax was a way to avoid military service, which is also a deliberate falsification. There's no historical documentation for this. It's made by apologists of modern Islam, which is the entire uh, historical, academic historical world. Um, it's not to say that that um, Christian or Jewish societies don't penalize non-believers, but at least in the Christian world, it was never a matter of law. The mentality that Marco Polo uh, states doesn't exist anywhere in the Christian Middle Ages, and um, and can't be squared with with the New Testament anyway. So um, to avoid all of this, though, by, by 1481. Uh, the end of the Serbian resistance, about 100,000 Serbian refugees fled into Hungary. And this stream of exiles were, you know, occurred over and over again, uh, well into the 18th century. And the Serbian, Serbian refugees were settled in, in the southern parts of the uh, Austrian Empire, and that became the Kraina, or the military border. And the Serbs ended up being the first rate in, uh, infantry of the, of the uh, Viennese Empire. And so these refugees became an elite fighting force for uh, Austria. And so, whether they realized it or not, they were sponsoring a resurgence of, of the Serbian nationality. So, of course, conversion to Islam wasn't directly forced, but you see the benefits of conversion. The Jizya tax was a form of humiliation for all non, um, non-Muslims and was often extracted by Jews. Um, now, the Islamic doctrine concerning governing uh, non-Islamic populations is to be found in the, in the conditions of Omar, um, which is named for Omar uh, al-Khattab, who reigned until 644. Now, his age is controversial, but his influence is not. Um, the conditions say that no churches are to be constructed or repaired. Churches are to be used to house Islamic soldiers or dignitaries when necessary. No cross can be displayed in public. Christians must not dress like Muslims so as to pass for them. And of course, Jews were never given any of these restrictions. Um, under the conditions of Omar, uh, no Christian could bear arms or of any kind. And the testimony in court was inferior to that of a, of a Muslim. Um, the death sentence was decreed for anyone fighting with a Muslim, even if it's in self-defense. So conversion here was by force in, in every possible way you could think of. Um, so this was the jizya tax. This was, this was what you had to do if you were orthodox in Islamic societies. And of course, no one in mainstream academia is going to tell you this because either they don't, they don't know or they're simply not telling the truth. Um, Jews were treated as Muslims treated Muslims. Um, a Jewish writer, um, Noam uh, Avigdor writes, um, he says, in fact, from the early 15th century on, the Ottomans actively encouraged Jewish immigration. Western European Jews received three invitations to settle in the Ottoman Empire. Two were from Muslim sultans, Muhammad II in the middle of the 15th century, and Bayezid II in 1492. The third came in a letter sent by Rabbi Yitzhak uh, uh, Sarfani in 1454. The Jewish communities in Europe uh, in the first part of that century invited his co-religionists to leave the torments they were enduring in Christendom and to seek safety and prosperity in Turkey. 
Rabbi Sarfati wrote that uh, here, meaning in Turkey, every man dwells at peace under his own vine and fig tree. So the author goes on to, to show a whole bunch of, of privileges that Jews received under Islamic control. There were a tiny handful of elite Greeks that could enjoy the same. As we mentioned, the Turks needed the Greeks for their administrative and medical knowledge. So the entire Jewish population, but a tiny percentage of the Venetian and Greek uh, elites did very well under the new Islamic ruling class. So really it was the Orthodox peasantry alone that, that suffered. So if you were already an elite in the old world, you had to convert to the new or you would lose everything you had. So conversion was essential to maintain what you used to have under the Christian empire. But Jews under the Ottoman state were the most loyal and the most prosperous, prosperous pillar of the regime. And they dominated the court very much like they did in, in Babylon. The physician to uh, Murad II was the Jew uh, Ishak Pasha. Solomon the Ashkenazi was a central financial player under Selim II. Uh, you know, Murad II ruled in the very early Renaissance and Selim II um, between 1566 and 1574. And that Solomon the Ashkenazi was so powerful that the Venetian embassy reports back to Italy that that, that man possessed the mind of the sultan. In other words, he controlled policy and told the sultan what to do. He wrote the peace treaty with the Venetian Republic and ran the regime in his own name. Um, so Solomon was, was a key figure in the reversal of the Venetian expulsion policy in the 1570s. Uh, another example, the, the customs offices of the sultan were strictly a Jewish province, and the Turkish Empire's overseas investments were identical with Jewish shipping interests. So it was the Jews, not the Muslims, that were the main competitor to Venice. So this Jewish elite was the wealthiest stratum of Turkish society, and like in Babylon, these groups th emerged theologically. Um, in the 16th century, Joseph Nasi was a key financial mediator under Selim II and Murad III, uh, the same period of time, and one of his roles was to strengthen the Jewish political and economic network that was to dominate Europe soon thereafter with strategic hubs in London, Antwerp, uh, the Italian republics, uh, and Krakow. And the Judaizer heresy in Novgorod in Russia was their attempt to bring that city under its sway. Um, so the banking sector in the Golden Horn, in Istanbul, was almost exclusively Jewish, and all international trade was mediated by them. And they ran that autonomously. So near the end of the Ottoman state's existence in the early 20th century, late 19th century, the Jewish population numbered around 400,000, or 3% of the population as a whole, but their control over international trade was absolutely to uh, total and complete. But the Orthodox people were targeted for extinction. There was no doubt about this. Um, but direct methods of oppression were less significant than indirect methods. Right after the conquest, as I've said many times on this show, the Serbian and Greek churches were sold to the highest bidder. Um, Greek merchants um, at the Thanar were to buy Slavic churches and monasteries uh, really at pennies on the dollar. And, of course, these sales required loans with interest, so these new owners would tax what was left of the Serbian economy. So under the Turks, the Serbian Orthodox or the Bulgarian Orthodox didn't have any clergy, so a strong family Orthodoxy uh, developed. And really the monks, which really were very poor hermits and wanderers, became the only source of religious and national education. You see, without a state, there is no Islam. But Orthodoxy functioned not only without a state, but uh, under the worst possible uh, conditions. Now, the millet system, um, some of you have, have heard of, It's um, these are organized Turkish dependencies under specific religious titles. So the Greek Orthodox millet included all Orthodox regardless of their ethnicity. But that does give the Serbs some rudimentary religious and historical knowledge. Um, but in buying churches and monasteries, which is what the Greeks did, um, they bought these these dioceses and they ran them as businessmen. It did create a, a resentment of wealthy Greeks, and um, and of course Jews were who they would go to to raise the money to buy it. Um, but there's no evidence that the millet system had anything to do with ethnic self-identification, as if ethnic ethnic groups didn't exist before. So you have uh, Orthodox people talking about you know nationalism and philatism, and they mention something about the millet system, um, and they just say that because everyone else says it. They don't really know what they're talking about. 
Um, certainly ethnic groups existed long before the millet system, but the millet system was non-ethnic, so it could not have served that that role. This shows you how bad so many of the mainstream uh, uh, history, uh, Orthodox histories are uh, in this in this part of the world. I've explained that the so-called, um, uh, if you go back uh, a few years ago, and on my own website I have two lengthy articles on the uh, false heresy of philatism, which of course was condemned or at least not followed by any other Orthodox country except uh, Constantinople. The Russians firmly supported the Bulgarian exarchate and maintained full communion with them right up until it ended. Um, so most of the Orthodox world considered the 1872 council as a robber council, or at least not to be taken seriously, as both the Patriarch of Jerusalem and Alexandria at the time said. Um, and it has everything to do with the Greeks having bought these seas um, and having no canonical right to possess them anymore. Um, and, of course, buying uh, churches and monasteries and dioceses were that's simply how you took over. So it was institutionalized heresy, institutionalized um, uh, nepotism and um, and uh, the, the buying of these sacramental sees for, for money. Um, and, of course, last but not least, the blood tax. We had thousands of, of healthy Serbian infants taken back to Turkey every year, made into Muslims and trained as part of the uh, elite elements of the Sultan's army called the Janissaries. And of course, this was the most hated of all the, Sur uh, the Turkish taxes. And then this corps eventually became independent of civilian control and terrorized the uh, Balkans in the late 18th century. And it's this terror that led to the first rebellions in 1804 against uh, Islamic rule. Again, all of these rebellions were condemned by the Patriarch of Constantinople, because he was a creature of the Turkish Empire. The Patriarch of Constantinople was not taken seriously under the Turkokratia, for the most part, because he was seen, and rightly so, as a, first of all, he had to buy that sea, so it had no legitimacy to begin with, and then because it served the interests of the Islamic rulers, um, it really was usually made fun of, and not taken very seriously at all by anyone, because it was vehemently opposed to any kind of anti-Turkish movement uh, in, in the Balkans. And that's why the um, so-called uh, uh, 1872, the uh, Philatism Senate is such a ridiculous thing, since Constantinople always condemned any kind of rebellion against the Turkish rule. Um, but as the Ottoman Empire began to fall apart, by the end of the 19th century, that empire became a semi-colony of the great Western powers. Because Turkey ultimately was one of the most backward societies in Europe. And then its finances, because it really couldn't keep up with the development of industry elsewhere, it came under Western control. Uh, unlike Russia or Serbia, the peasantry in Turkey bore the full brunt of the tax burden, paying tax farmers and moneylenders uh, almost half their crop. And that doesn't include any debt. So large-scale agriculture in the Turkish Empire was controlled by Western capital. And it really got to the point where, in Istanbul, that... Um, and it also in a number of major coastal cities, received grain and flour from abroad, since Britain exported almost the entire plantation crop that was grown locally. So foreign capital had a monopoly in the production and export of, of tobacco, um, all food products, wine and everything else, totally controlling rural areas. So foreign capital acted as the organizer of production and created a almost a neo-feudal dependence of peasants uh, as extremely cheap labor. This only developed at the very end of the 19th century. But the industrial drive under um, Abdul Hamid II and uh, Mehmed V, who died in 1918, um, the empire had a lot of natural wealth, but the industrialization drive was a failure. Um, that's because extractive industries, which were captured by foreign companies, became Turkey's new role in the international division of labor. It became a dependent state, and so industry never really took off. This is what happens when you have a totally dependent uh, peasant, peasantry that could be exploited so that foreign businessmen could reap huge profits that never benefited the peasantry or the Turkish treasury. And so this is really where these rebellions began, not just in Christian areas, but in Islamic areas, especially in places like Egypt, against the um, against Islamic rule. So the Patrick of Constantinople um, was supporting these foreign business interests, not to mention the, the Jewish control of the... Of the um, of the Turkish state, showing you how little legitimacy it had. It had no canonical legitimacy, it had no religious legitimacy, and certainly had no moral legitimacy. 
and this is why you have you know separate um, um, institutions in the Balkans against um, Constantinople, especially the Bulgarian Exarchate, who came into existence um, to fight these very same phenomena. In 1881, the so-called administration of the Ottoman public debt was created by the Western powers to take all productive ca- uh, productive capital out of the empire in exchange for debt reduction. So the administration was almost like a bankruptcy court. It included representatives of Britain, Fan- France, uh, Germany, Italy, Austria-Hungary, um, and local creditors as well. So by 1908, foreigners fully controlled the finances of the empire. Foreign banks controlled all financial decisions, and it completely replaced the Ottoman Ministry of Finance. So this became the court camarilla of Western forces, and it was based on the corruption of, of the bureaucracy and, and the unlimited arbitrariness of officials, including religious elites of both Islamic and, 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 and Christian sorts. So embezzlement and arbitrariness and corruption became the order of the day. Um, so um, Sultan Abdul Hamid II used a policy divide and conquer to mobilize Islam against Christians in the empire, and he created this or sponsored the pan-Islamic ideology that was to keep the state together. But at the, it still was largely a colony of Britain and France. But then the movement shifted to Germany, which soon took control of the empire's armed forces. Sorry, that was one of my cats, by the way, who came jumping on here and took a notebook and threw it off the side of the desk. Stanley, get down. So the Turkish government tried to use Germany to strengthen the army and a suffering economy. And it broke the monopoly of these businessmen over her, over her resource, or tried to break it. So using Germany was a way to challenge Britain and France. Either way, it was a, a, to colonize um, what was left of the Ottoman Empire. Now, um, this failing and foreign-dominated Ottoman state uh, led to rebellions in the Islamic world, and one of those was Albania. Um, Albania was really a post facto name. It was no, referred to no ethnic group whatsoever, um, but it was given to uh, groups of Islamic landlords that sought to protect themselves from the, the anger of, of Christian peasants. It was never meant to be an ethnic identity. It was never meant to be. Um, but the point is that there was no Ottoman Empire any longer. It was under the control of Western powers. So Islamic groups uh, outside of the Turkish heartland sought to separate from it and create their own institutions, uh, armed institutions, to protect themselves from, the, from uh, Christianity. So after the First Balkan War, uh, both Bulgaria and Romania were encouraged to pick any pretext to invade Serbia, really. And this is the reason that the so-called Albanian nation came into existence. The purpose, of course, was to cut Serbia off from Montenegro. Um, so you have some scattered tribes, uh, the mountainous regions in the southwestern Balkans, um, under the control of the Bays or the oligarchy, created some sort of Islamic, uh, sorry, uh, Albanian confederation in 1912. And they feared the wrath of the long-suffering Orthodox peoples of the area. Um, but um, um, approving the progress and technical development that doesn't necessarily make a state powerful, um, places like Montenegro did a lot better than the entire uh, empire of Turkey. Um, but the so-called Albanian nation is one of these uh, falsehoods that came out of the foreign domination of the uh, Ottoman Empire. And um, you have um, Zickel and um, uh, Swaki in 1994. They write this. One of Serbia's primary war aims was to gain an Adriatic port, preferably Drez. Uh, Austria-Hungary and Italy opposed giving Serbia an outlet to the Adriatic, which they feared would become a Russian port. Rather, they supported the creation of an autonomous Albania. But there was no notion of an Albania. They the created the, the Treaty of San Stefano a piece that led to the creation of independent states and the ruins of the Turkish Imperium in, in the Balkans, took that land and divided it among the victors, especially Bulgaria and Serbia. But a generation before this, a group of disaffected Islamic landlords created what we now know as the um, Prisren League, and they created an autonomous status from, from Turkey. That was eventually called Albania later on, and it was chaired by a French-based landlord, uh, Abdil Bey uh, Fashiri. The Prisren League which, you know, again, was eventually called Albania for short, was a meeting of 47 Ottoman oligarchs. Um, and the point was to protect their money and serfs. Um, the Karinami was their 
ideological manifesto. And Albanian leaders, so-called Albanian leaders, uh, emphasize in it their intention to preserve and maintain the territorial integrity of the Ottoman state in the Balkans, um, while, it says, the struggle in arms to defend the wholeness of the territories of Albania. The so-called rights of the Albanian nation were nothing more than the oligarchy of freight that serves would deprive them of their serfs. The concept of Albania, quote-unquote, simply referred to this desire to maintain the Ottoman state in the Balkans. But knowing that this was impossible after a while, Albania then became the demand of a separate state in order to mount a defense against the vengeful Slavs. But either Karanami um, never even mentioned any kind of independence or autonomy, just the creation of a Bal Balkan Islamic partition that they eventually called Albania. And Otto von Bismarck said the same thing. He said there is no such thing as Albania, it's called a, ge a geographic idea only. So it was not an ethnic group, it was never meant to be an ethnic group. It was a method to create some legal organization to stop the loss of territory to Orthodox groups. Um, the great powers saw the League as a way to extend Ottoman power against the Slavic nations. Um, but the Ottoman state wasn't even Ottoman anymore. So the process went like this. I mean, the powers would, would order Turkey to use military force to keep the Prison League um, under control, but that had the intended consequence of giving Turkish armies another excuse to remain in the Balkans, despite the fact that these were under uh, either British or German generals. Um, so the concept was that since Turkey was to be no more, the Islamic elites of the area needed to band together for, to, for protection. And this became Islamic Bosnia, and this became Albania. Um, but they were disaffected from the, uh, by the failure of the country that created them. They had no choice but to demand autonomy from a failing auto uh, Ottoman state. But they did receive tons of weapons and financing from Turkey as a rearguard action to preserve their influence in the Balkans. But Albania made no claim to any ethnic unity whatsoever. It wasn't a nation in any, even a rudimentary sense of the term. Most of the delegates of the League were under the impression that the name of the group was the League of Real Muslims, which was the initial name of the organization. Uh, and most were convinced early on that it was just a, an economic organization of local landlords. Um, when uh, Fashiri himself uh, wanted the group to be called the Central Committee for Defending Albanian Rights, that was ignored by its members and it was just called the Istanbul Committee from, from there on. But there's no mention almost at all of anything called Albania. Um, Albania referred to nothing other than those areas that had Islamic, uh, at least an Islamic elite majority. Um, there was no ethnic identity mentioned or even offered until both the British and the Austrians realized that it was a usable concept. The English press invented the Albanian ethnicity. It had no separate alphabet or language. It had no Albanian school system, something that all other ethnic groups in the area established at the time. Um, and it's very suspicious that the Prison League followed British directives on every major and minor issue of foreign policy, since they dominated the Ottoman Empire anyway at the time. So the whole point was not only to maintain their serfs and their money against the Slavs, but then they were used by the Western powers to stand against Russian influence. Uh, and that also includes the independence of Slavs and even Romanians. Um, and they had some use to the Western powers in that sense. Um, so once the Russian Empire destroyed Turkey once and for all, the Western powers ended up scrambling to find some suitable substitute, and so then you had Bosnia and Albania that were created uh, to do just that. Um, so they had a choice. The Western powers could either pretend that these were nations, like Albania or Bosnia, or to defend the Ottoman state at all costs. So the former option, you know, to, to create nations was the creation of Albania, but the final option, the latter option, was what the, the English eventually opted for, especially when the Germans took over Turkey uh, near the beginning of World War I. So Albania ended up being a, a, cute, uh, a crude curiosity more than anything else. Um, there's no architectural evidence that there was any separate group of people there. They were just descendants of Serbs and Greeks that were forced to convert to Islam. Albania, quote-unquote, exists solely to frustrate Serbian and hence Russo-Bulgarian aims in the 20th century Balkans. Um, so the alliance of Muslims in Kosovo, Albania, and, and Bosnia, Vienna was in 1912, was creating a local Islamic alliance to destroy Serbia once and for all. 
So Austria controlled and possessed Bosnia at the time. Um, and um, the point of it was to permit Vienna to neutralize any nationalist movement among Bosnian Serbs. And um, and making this, it was almost comical in the sense that the governor of Bosnia, Benjamin Calais, invented the, the concept of Islamic Bosnia, created this new nation personally. Um, and Calais' life really, it, it reads like a character from Gogol. He was a bureaucratic, petty, just the worst example of a company man. Um, and it was funny that he had written his own book. He had written a book um, that was relatively pro-Serbia. He also denied the existence of anything called uh, Bosnia or Albania. Um, and he thought that Serbia was favorable to Austrian um, aspirations and that this is something that the Austrians may benefit from. But because this was not the policy of, of Vienna, he had to ban his own book in Bosnia because that ideology was not permitted anymore. And it shows you what kind of a man this was, that he would ban his own book in order to carry out the commands of uh, both the British and the, the Viennese Empire that he worked for. Um, but after 1913, Serbia was very prostrate and, and was bullied by Vienna. Um, and um, the Balkan Muslims in, in Bosnia and Kosovo were used by the Turks um, to eliminate Serbian revolutionaries, even as early as 1815. You know, Islamic irregulars from Kosovo and parts of Bosnia were unleashed as the uh, World War, um, as the early rebellions uh, really did incredible damage to the Turkish state, and they became desperate. And so these Islamic groups um, were called nations of one kind or another. They weren't called, you know, Bosnia or, or Kosovo at that point, or uh, Albania at that point. But this is what they needed to create to fight the Serbian uh, revolutionaries uh, when Turkey simply didn't have the resources to, to fight back. Um, so Islam was really a, a bizarre pathogen in, in European society. These European Islamic groups were the creation of the Turkish Empire, but once an empire was gone, they had no further purpose. And so um, the point of them, uh, throughout, even, even today, was to make war on the Slavs. Um, but, you know, even, even one of the great defenders of so-called Albanian uh, ethnicity, uh, Professor M. Vickers, uh, writes this. He says, the Albanian national ideals still had to compete with tribal particularism. Christian Albanians were united primarily by their intense mistrust and dislike of Ottoman rule. The predominantly Muslim Kosovars were conservative by nature and identified themselves religiously with the Ottomans. The Southern Orthodox Christians, for their part, were heavily influenced by Greece, and many of their notables desiring union with Greece. But this is supposed to be Albania. So there is no national idea, and there's no nation by that name. And the fact that Vickers, who was a defender of the Albanian idea, would say something like that, showing that all the groups in so-called Albania, um, the Muslims were, were loyal to um, the Ottomans, the Orthodox were loyal to Greece, well, where's Albania then? So this is absolute nonsense. Albania was nothing more than the oligarchy, the Islamic oligarchy, um, with a heavy Jewish influence, seeking to band together to make war on the, um, the angry uh, Slavic peasantry and their own military elites from taking revenge on them and taking their property back, in essence. Um, so Albania has no existence. It's simply there to do the bidding of the great powers. And as much as it's, it's, it's an Islamic movement, it's also a Jewish movement. Since the Jews were, you know, ran to the cities to find protection, and so they did finance these Islamic movements, um, whether it be in Bosnia or what they later called Albania. And keep in mind, these were nothing other than Islamic and Jewish oligarchs banding together to fight Slavs, and they had no, not even a, a, a pretense to any kind of ethnic unity. So, this is what Islam is, from its very beginning to today. Islam is a violent cancer in Europe, used by the ruling class to destroy orthodoxy in Yugoslavia and southern Russia. But remember something else. After the, the Ottoman defeat in the First World War, and the Ottoman Empire was, as, as we know, controlled by foreign powers anyway, Islam was in steep decline. It had few members. It was, it was deeply divided. It was dying a slow death. 
it was associated with the defeat of the Ottomans. So the Western powers did more than just create these these little islands of, of oligarchy. They reinvented Islam to control Slavic and Romanian nationalism in in uh, the Balkans and even Armenia in parts of the Middle East. So this new modern Islam is very different from the ancient version because this was entirely created by the Western powers. But, you know, from its origin in the 7th and 8th century, this was a Jewish uh, movement, but had to be reinvigorated and reinvented by the great powers in the early 20th century. So, you know, Islam was was disappearing after the defeat of Turkey at the end of World War I. Uh, it was disappearing, and it had no legitimacy, it had no... It had no, um, it wasn't connected to any state anymore. Without a state, there is no Muslim, is Islam, because Islam is the state. But the Western powers, um, recreated and reinvigorated Islam to use against the Slavs in the early 20th century. Islam is not a religion. It is a political movement. It is a military doctrine to serve the interests of the great powers. And so whether you go back to the ancient Islamic uh, origins of this pagan group um, that the Jews helped create uh, into a military force that could then tax the caravans and create this new is- is Islamic and Jewish state, all the way up to its reinvention by the great powers to control the Russians and the Slavs in the Middle East and, um, and in the Balkans, Islam has no legitimacy at any level whatsoever. Um, you know, the civilization of, of Iran and the, 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 the Shiites has its own legitimacy. They've had nothing to do with any of this. This is strictly a, a Sunni or, or, you know, nonpartisan, uh, strictly political Islamic movement. Uh, so the Iranians are a different story. But these movements, this aspect of Islam has no uh, legitimacy. It has no, even a moral functionality. It's simply used as a hammer to use against the Slavs, uh, whether it be by the British or by um, or by the Americans today, it serves the interests of imperial powers, uh, as does the invention of Bosnia or the the ridiculous uh, uh, invention of Albania. All of which were nothing more than oligarchs banding together to protect themselves once their empire crumbled. Anyway, everyone, thank you for listening, and I will talk to you next time. Bye.